Hey folks, today we're going to record book 23, The Trunk of the Olive Tree. Last time we did book 22, The Death in the Great Hall chapter, in which all the suitors were, I don't want to use the word murdered, but I guess murdered by Odysseus. Um, they deserved it. It was poetic justice. But uh, more questionably, Odysseus uh, then hung all of the maids who had slept with the suitors, and it was pretty violent and unfortunate. Uh, but that brings us to book 23, The Trunk of the Olive Tree. I have pretty much abandoned the chopped up version of the book because um, it misses too much stuff. And I am not going to change that. So on to the other version. Uh, book 23, The Trunk of the Olive Tree. Uh, remember that uh, finally, now that the hall has been cleaned, now that... that um, all of the suitors and all of the maids who were evil were killed. Um, Odysseus is now sending Eurycleia to wake up his wife, Penelope, and he is going to meet her as a husband returned uh, from his long and dangerous sea voyage. So that is where we're at. Uh, one second here. I think it's too dark. I got to turn on the light. It had gotten darker in there than I thought it had. And uh, it's Monday, and I'm recording into the into the evening, so the sun is setting outside. And, um, I'm not going to be in on Tuesday. I've got got to take my son to an appointment, so it's you know sort of crazy. Uh, but let me let me try and finish up this chapter for you so that we can get the week's recordings posted. Uh, book twenty three, the trunk of the olive tree. The old nurse went upstairs, exulting, with knees toiling and patter of slapping feet, to tell the mistress of her lord's return, and cried out by the lady's pillow. Wake, wake up, dear child, Penelope, come down, see with your own eyes what all these years you long for. Odysseus is here. Oh, in the end he came, and he has killed your suitors, killed them all, who made his house a brothel, and ate his cattle, and raised their hands against his son, Penelope said. Dear nurse, the gods have touched you. They can put chaos into the clearest head or bring a lunatic down to earth. Good sense you always had. They've touched you. What is this mockery you wake me up to tell me, breaking in on my sweet spell of sleep? I had not dozed away so tranquilly since my lord went to war on that ill wind to Ilion. Oh, leave me. Back downstairs. If any other of my women came in babbling things like these to startle me, I'd see her flogged out of the house. Your old age spares you that. Eurycleia said, Would I play such a trick on you, dear child? It's true, true, as I tell you, he's come. That stranger they were baiting was Odysseus. Telemachus knew it days ago. Cool head never to give his father away till he paid off those swollen dogs. The lady in her heart's joy now sprang up with sudden dazzling tears and hugged the old one, crying out, But... Try to make it clear. If he came home in secret, as you say, could he engage them single-handed? How? They were all down there, still in the same crowd, to this Eurycleia said. I did not see it. I knew nothing. I only heard the groan to men dying. We sat still in the inner rooms, holding our breath and marveling, shut in until Telemachus came to the door and called me. Your own dear son, sent this time by his father. So I went out and found Odysseus erect with the dead men littering the floor, and this way and that, if you had only seen him, it would have made your heart glow hot. A lion splashed with a mire and blood, but how the cold corpses are all gathered at the gate, and he has cleansed his hall with fire and brimstone, a great blaze. Then he sent me here to you. Come with me, you may embark this time for happiness together after pain, after long years. Here's your prayer, your passion granted, your own Lord lives. He's at home, he found you safe, he found his son. The suitors abused his house, but he has brought them down. The attentive lady said, do not lose yourself in this rejoicing. Wait, you know how splendid that return would be for us. How dear to me, dear to his son and mine, but no. It is not possible. Your notion must be wrong. Some god has killed the suitors. A god, a sick, sick of their arrogance and brutal malice, for they honored no living good or bad, and sorry, no one living good or bad who ever came their way. Blind young fools. They've tasted death for it. But the true person of Odysseus? 
He has lost his home. He died, died far from Greece. The old nurse sighed. How queer the way you talk. Here he is, larger than life, by his own fire, and you deny he ever will get home. Child, you always were mistrustful, but there is one sure mark that I can tell you. That scar left by the boar's tusk long ago, I recognized it when I bathed his feet and would have told you, but he stopped my mouth and forbade me in his craftiness. Come down. I stake my life on it. He's here. Let me die in agony if I lie. Penelope said, Nurse dear, though you have your wits about you, still it is hard not to be taken in. By the immortals, let us join my son, though, and see the dead and strange one who killed them. She turned then to descend the stair, her heart in tumult. Had she better keep her distance and question him, her husband? Should she run up to him, take his hand and kiss him now? Crossing the door still, she sat down at once in firelight against the nearest wall, across the room from the Lord Odysseus. There, leaning against a pillar, sat the man, and never lifted up his eyes, but only waited for what his wife would say when she had seen him. And she, for a long time, sat deathly still, in wonderment, for sometimes as she gazed she found him, yes, clearly like her husband, but sometimes blood and rags were all she saw. Telemachus's voice came to her ears. Mother, cruel mother, do you feel nothing, drawing yourself apart this way from father? Will you not sit with him and talk and question him? What other woman could remain so cold, who shuns her lord, and he come back to her from wars and wandering after twenty years? Your heart is hard as flint and never changes. Penelope answered, I am stunned, child. I cannot speak to him. I cannot question him. I cannot keep my eyes upon his face. If really he is Odysseus, truly home beyond all doubt, we too shall know each other better than you or anyone. There are secret signs we know, we too. A smile came now to the lips of the patient hero Odysseus, who turned to Telemachus and said, Peace! Let your mother test me at her leisure. Before long she will see and know me best. These tatters, dirt, all that I'm caked with now, make her to look hard at me and doubt me still. As to this massacre, we must see the end. Whoever kills one citizen you know, and has no force of armed men at his back, had better take himself abroad by night. And leave his kin. Well, we cut down the flower of Ithaca, the mainstay of the town. Consider that. Remember we talked about this a long time ago. Uh... When you kill the firstborn son of another house, it starts what's called a blood feud. And Odysseus has just started a hundred of them all at once by killing all of these suitors. Uh, so he knows that their parents and their siblings are coming for him and they're coming for Telemachus too. And they're now essentially fugitives. Uh, he's come home only to have to run away again. And that's, that's unfortunate. Telemachus replied respectfully, Dear father, enough that you yourself study the danger far side foresighted in combat as you are. They say you have no rival. We three stand ready to follow you in fight, I say. For what our strength avails, we have the courage. He's talking about, of course, himself and the swineherd and the cowherd who fought with them earlier. And the great tactician Odysseus answered, Good, here's our best maneuver as I see it. Bathe, you three, and put on fresh clothes. Order the women to adorn themselves and let our admirable harper choose a tune for dancing, some light-hearted air and strum it. Anyone going by or any neighbor will think it's a wedding feast that he hears. These deaths must not be cried about the town till we can slip away to our own woods. We'll see what weapon then Zeus puts into our hands. They listened attentively and did his bidding, bathed and dressed afresh, and all the maids adorned themselves. Then Phemius the harper took his polished shell and plucked the strings, moving the company to desire for singing, for they sway and beat of dancing until they made the manor hall resound with gaiety of men and grace of women. Anyone passing on the road would say, Married at last, I see, the queen so many courted, sly, caddish wife. She would not keep, not she, the lord's estate until he came. So travelers' thoughts might run, but no one guessed the truth. Great-hearted Odysseus, home at last, was being bathed now by Eurynome, and rubbed with golden oil, and clothed again in a fresh tunic and a cloak. Athena lent him beauty head to foot. She made him taller and massive, too, with crisping hair like in curls like petals of wild hyacinth. But all red golden. Think of gold, infused on silver by a craftsman, whose fine art Hephaestus taught him, or Athena, one whose work moves to delight, just so she lavished beauty over Odysseus's head and shoulders. He sat then in the same chair by the pillar, facing his silent wife, and said, Strange woman, 
The immortals of Olympus made you hard, harder than any. Who else in the world would keep aloof as you do from her husband if he returned her from years of trouble, cast on his own land in the tw 20th year? Nurse, make up a bed for me to sleep on. Her heart is iron in her breast. Penelope spoke, spoke to Odysseus now. She said, strange man, if man you are, this is no pride on my part, nor scorn for you, not even wonder merely. I know so well how you, how he, appeared boarding that ship for Troy, but all the same. Make up his bed for him, Eurycleia. Place it outside the bedchamber my lord built with his own hands. Pile the big bed with fleeces, rugs, and sheets of purest linen. With this, she tried to tried him to the breaking point, and he turned on her in a flash, raging, Woman, by heaven, you've stung me now. Who dared move my bed? No builder had the skill for that, unless a god came down to turn the trick. No mortal in his best days could budget with a crowbar. That is our pact and our pledge, our secret sign, built into that bed, my handiwork, and no one else's. An old trunk of olive grew like a pillar on the building plot, and I laid out our bedroom round that tree, lined up the stone walls, built the walls and roof, gave it a doorway and smooth-fitting doors. Then I lopped off the silvery leaves and branches, hewed and shaped that stump from the roots up into a bedpost, drilled it, let it serve. As a model for the rest, I planed them all, inlaid them all with silver, gold, and ivory, and stretched a bed between, a pliant web of oxide thongs dyed crimson. There's our sign. I know no more. Could someone else's hand have sawn that trunk and dragged the frame away? Their secret, as she'd heard it told, her knees grew tremulous and weak, and her heart failed her. With eyes brimming tears, she ran to him, throwing her arms around his neck and kissed him, murmuring, Do not rage at me, Odysseus. No one ever matched your caution. Think what difficulty the gods gave. They denied us life together in our prime, and flowering years kept us from crossing into age together. Forgive me. Don't be angry. I could not welcome you with love on sight. I armed myself long ago against the frauds of men, impostors who might come, and all those many whose underhanded ways bring evil on. Helen of Argos, daughter of Zeus, and Leda, would she have joined the stranger, lain with him. Helen, sorry, um, got, got distracted there. There was a weird noise. Helen of Argos, daughter of Zeus, and Leda, would she have joined the stranger, lain with him, if... She had known her destiny, known the Greeks in arms would bring her back to her own country. Surely a goddess moved her to adultery, her blood unchilled by war and evil coming, the years of desolation, ours too. But here and now, what sign could be so clear as this of our bed? No other man has ever laid eyes on it, only my own slave, Actoris, that my father sent with me as a gift. She kept at our door. You make my stiff heart know that I am yours. So this was a final test of Odysseus by Penelope. Um, Odysseus built the house, and when he built the bed, uh, one of the posts of the bed was an olive tree that um, he left in the ground. And so the bed is literally rooted to the ground and can't be moved. And so she was like, just move his bed out into the hallway. And he's like, what? Right. And so she knows now that it's actually him. But of course, this bed and the tree bedpost are probably symbolic. Um, this is a story about family and family values. And when it comes down to it, Odysseus returns. And, um, you know, maybe this, this bedpost is symbolic of the family tree, right? Of... Uh, you know, the, the, I mean, the idea of the family tree goes back forever, uh, maybe as far as ancient Greece. So I think there's, there's maybe a clear connection there. Uh, but the idea of the roots, you know, this is where Odysseus's roots are. This is where he belongs. This is where his father grew up and his grandfather and his family and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, back to their reunion. Now from his breast into his eyes, the ache of longing mounted, and he wept at last. His dear wife, clear and faithful in his arms, longed for as the sun-warmed earth is longed for by a swimmer spent in rough water, where his ship went down under Poseidon's blows, gale winds and tons of sea. Few men can keep alive through a big surf to crawl clotted with brine on kindly beaches. Enjoy, enjoy knowing the abyss behind. And so she too rejoiced, her gaze upon her husband, her white arms round him, pressing as though forever. It's a pretty, pretty poignant reunion, especially because of the metaphor that, um, I guess it's a simile, as, the simile that, that Homer uses here. He says that the feeling of Odysseus hugging his wife is the same feeling that a man lost at sea gets when he washes up on shore. 
he was drowning. He thought he wouldn't make it. And finally, he's he's on the sand. And of course, this essentially is what happened to Odysseus, right? He was lost at sea. It's been an incredibly long sea voyage. And, and his home is in Ithaca. His home is his wife, Penelope. And that's a pretty powerful image um, about relationships and and the power of family and the power of love i think the connection that they share anyway the rose dawn might have found them weeping still had not gray-eyed athena slowed the night when night was most profound and held the dawn under the ocean of the east that glossy team fire bright and day bright the dawn's horses that draw her heavenward for men athena stayed their harnessing Ah, so the night would have gone by too fast and Odysseus wouldn't have had enough time with his wife. Remember, tomorrow he's got to run away because he's murdered these suitors and he's got to take Telemachus with him because Telemachus is also guilty of this uh, atrocity. I don't know what you want to call it. And so he has this one night with his wife after 20 years and Athena being kind uh, changed the, the pace of time. Now, obviously this can't happen, but it's true that some moments seem longer than others and some moments seem shorter. And, and I think this is a commentary on the way that time sometimes feels dilated for us. It feels like it's expanded or that it's shortened. Um, and that's, that's the case here. So then said Odysseus, my dear, we have not won through to the end. One trial. I do not know how long is left for me to see fulfilled. Tiresias, the ghost forewarned me the night I stood upon the shore of death, asking about my friends, homecoming, and my own. But now the hour grows late. It is bedtime. The rest will be sweet for us. Let us lie down. To this Penelope replied, That bed, that rest is yours, whenever you desire moves you. Now the kind powers have brought you home at last. But as your thought has dwelt upon it, tell me, what is the trial you face? I must know soon. What does it matter if I learn tonight? The teller of many stories said, my strange one, must you again, and even now, urge me to talk? Here's a plotting tale, no charm to it, no relish in the telling. Tiresias told me I must take an oar and trudge the mainland, going from town to town, until I discover men who have never seen the salt blue sea, nor flavor of salt meat. Strangers, to painted prows, to watercraft, and oars like wings, dipping across the water. The moment of revelation, he foretold, was thus, for you may share the prophecy. Some traveler, falling in with me, will say, a winnowing fan, is that on your shoulder, sir? There I must plant my oar, on the very spot, with burnt offerings to Poseidon of the waters, a ram, a bull, a great buck boar. Thereafter, when I come home again, I am to slay full hecatombs to the gods who own broad heaven one by one. Then death will drift upon me from seaward, as mild as air, mild as your hand, in my well-tended weariness of my age. Contented folk around me on our island, he said, all this must come true. Penelope said, if by the gods' grace... Age, at least, is kind. We have that promise. Trials will end in peace. So he confided in her, and she answered. Meanwhile, Eurynome and the nurse together laid coverlets on the master's bed, working in haste by torchlight. Eurycleia retired to her quarters for the night, and then Eurynome, as maid in waiting, lighted her lord and lady to their chamber with bright brands. She vanished. So they came into that bed so steadfast, loved of old, opening glad arms to one another. Telemachus, by now had hushed the dancing, hushed the women. In the darkened hall, he and the cowherd and the swineherd slept. The royal pair mingled in love again, and afterwards lay reveling in stories. Hers of the siege, her beauty stood at home from arrogant suitors crowding on her sight, and how they fed their courtship on his cattle, oxen and fat sheep, and drank up rivers of wine out of the vats. Odysseus told of what hard blows he had dealt out to others, and of what blows he had taken, all that story she could not close her eyes till all was told. His raid of the Sicones first of all, first of all, then how he visited the Lotus Eaters and what the Cyclops did and how those shipmates pitilessly devoured were avenged. Then his touching of Aeolus's isle, how that king refitted him for sailing to Ithaca, all vain, gales blew him back, groaning over the fish-cold sea. Then how he reached the Lestragonians' distant bay, and how they smashed his ships and his companions. Circe then, of her deceit and magic, then of his voyage to the wide underworld of dark, the house of death, the questioning of Tiresias, Theban spirit, dead companions, many he saw there, and his mother too. Of this he told his wife, and told how later he heard the choir of maddening sirens, uh, coasted the wandering rocks, Charybdis's pool, and the fiend Scylla, who takes a toll of men. Thou, then how his shipmates killed Lord Helios's cattle, and how Zeus, thundering in towering heaven, split their fast ship with his fuming bolt. 
so all hands perished. He alone survived, cast away on Calypso's isle, Ogygia. He told them how the nymph detained him there in her smooth caves, craving him for her husband, and how in her devoted lust she swore he should not die nor grow old all his days, but he held out against her. Last of all, what sea toil brought him to the Phaeacians, their welcome, how they took him to their hearts and gave him passage to his own dear island with gifts of garments of gold and bronze. Remembering, he drowsed over the story's end, sweet sleep relaxed his limbs and his care-burdened breast. Other affairs were in Athena's keeping. Waiting until Odysseus had his pleasure of love and sleep, the gray-eyed one bestirred the fresh dawn from her bed of paling ocean to bring up daylight to her golden chair. And from his fleecy bed, Odysseus arose. He said to Penelope, My lady, what ordeals have we not endured? Here, waiting, you had your grief while my return dragged out. My hard adventures pitting myself against the gods' will, and Zeus, who pinned me down far from home. But now our life resumes. We've come together to our longed-for bed, take care of what has left me in our house. As to the flocks, that pack of wolves laid waste, they'll be replenished. Scores I'll get on raids, and other scores our island friends will give me till all the folds are full again. This day I'm off up country to the orchards. I must see my noble father, for he missed me sorely. And here is my command to you, a strict one, though you may need none, clever as you are. Word will get about, as the sun goes higher, of how I killed those lads. Go to your rooms on the upper floor and take your women. Stay there with never a glance outside or a word to anyone. Fitting cuirass and sword belt to his shoulders, he woke his herdsmen, woke Telemachus, ordering all in arms. They dressed quickly, and all in war gear sallied from the gate led by Odysseus. Now it was a broad day, but these three men, Athena, hid in the darkness, going before them swiftly from the town. So... Um, we're getting to the end of the book. We're on to book 24 next time. Uh, in book 24, Odysseus is, is running away. You know, like he knows he's a wanted man now for the murders that he's committed. But he has to see his father before he goes. Uh, his father, Laertes, who was an Argonaut, he's going to see his dad. Um, this is a family story after all. And um, let him know that he survived and that he's come home. And that's theoretically what's going to happen in chapter 24. But also in chapter 24, the suitor's parents are going to find out that the suitors have been murdered. And many of them are from Ithaca, Odysseus's own island. And so they're going to set out in pursuit of Odysseus and come and try and find him. So, um, Marshall, I'm recording. Um, so anyway, that's, that's how the book's going to end. And we'll, we'll get to that one next time. Thanks for your time and attention.